Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone who lives there. Today, we are honored to be sitting down with Marathon Ontario Mayor Rick Dumas. But before we jump into that interview, we would want to say that we couldn't embark on this journey without your support. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page on the Cross Border Interviews website at www.crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering the kind of content that you've come to expect from us. Now, on to the interview. Rick, I want to thank you so much for doing this today. Greatly appreciate it for sitting down and uh, talking about yourself and talking about the town of Marathon, Ontario. But I want to start with you, and I want to start with a general question, and it's a basic question that is the premise of this show, and that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Rick? You know, it's a good question, Chris, but the reality, I think I look back and uh, pre-1991 when I first ran for council, I was involved with many organizations within the municipality, youth as well. I ran, uh, you know, youth uh, baseball, youth uh, bowling, as well as uh, different various groups, men's fastball, ma ma marathons, first uh, uh, Harley Owners Group, which is a group of individuals who want to provide service back to the community through our biking habits, you know, Toys for Tots programs, and then uh, highway cleanups, adopting highway programs, always been involved pre-1991. Then, you know, along the way, I was a small businessman, and I was a little bit frustrated with the then council and mayor, and I wrote a letter and I asked for some clarification on taxation. I didn't get really much of a response, so I, I wrote again and then no response. So at that time, I thought, well, the only way to get, you know, and make change within the municipal government is to put my name forward. And that's what I did in 1991, and I got voted in overwhelmingly with the most votes in that that era. And I haven't uh, looked back. I, I ran for mayor in 1997, uh, Chris, and uh, there was five of us running. I lost by about 12 votes to an, inco an incoming individual who uh, who basically was, around, and it was a lot of history around that, Chris, it was around the Ontario teacher strike. And I told the teachers at that time very point blank, and that's the kind of individual I am, uh, I say the way it is, that I was not their employer, the Ontario government was their employer. So I think that really hurt me in regards to some of that support from that that group of individuals. So I lost, I was out of council for three years. It was, it was quite a, a dramatic thing for me because that six years prior to that, I was really involved and I, I missed it a lot. So again, I ran in 2000 and got reelected. And then uh, in 2003, I decided to uh, to take on uh, one more term. And then in 2006 came along and I decided I'm going to run for mayor. And uh, the rest of history, I've been acclaimed uh, since 2010. So I, I want to talk that you are the perfect guest to ask this question to because you have been at the council table for some time and you have seen mm -hmm. how municipalities have changed. And I think right. this is the most important thing I want to talk about today with you, particularly with your time frame that you've been on council. How much has municipal politics and municipal governance changed over the tenure of your time as municipal uh, council and as a municipal mayor? Well, it's, it's changed, in my view, dramatically. I mean, obviously, with the the uh, onset of the social media aspects in the last decade or so, it's really made council uh, a situation where you really, you know, you don't know if you're pleasing the public because it, there's a lot of uh, the, you know, the information, the innuendos being shared on social media. I, and for one thing, Chris, I've never participated in any social media platform whatsoever. I don't have any of them downloaded on my phone or my, my iPads. But I try to stay tuned in with our younger councils. But I've I've always tried to be a leadership in my my concept right from day one, 1991. And I looked at the council then. It was more, we, we dealt with a lot of things. We used to have a lot of paperwork, Chris. We used to deal with every issue. Um, we used to have six-hour meetings in the 90s. And then we st slowly started to eliminate that and say to administration, use vet through that information and bring the relevant information to council. So I've seen a dramatic change in that with our leadership. And then uh, as I became mayor, I thought, you know what, my concept was always open, accessible, and, and uh, you know, come and talk to us. So when I when I first got elected as mayor, I brought to my council and through the Ontario Municipal Association, sorry, the, the Ontario Municipal Affairs Regional Office, who is our governing body from the provincial government, I said, I want to have an, an open door policy. My my thing is always about open door. So I, I then opened the council chambers. They thought I was really crazy. But I opened the council chambers from 6.30 to 7 for anybody in the community to come and talk to us. 
No agenda, no no uh, delegation, just come and talk to us. But there was no advancement of any of the discussion we had with those individuals. They could just come in and, and speak their piece on whatever the issue might have been. The reality was, we did that for a better part of a decade. Nobody really came, maybe a couple individuals over that whole 10 years. So we didn't cancel the program. I felt that, well, we're, we're trying to offer an open door policy. So with that being said, I also wanted to get incorporating the change in councils and trying to get youth involved, Chris. And so uh, 2011, I asked my council to go through the uh, uh, government week in October and every year in Ontario, we go to high school and we talk to the students about governance and, and governance models and what their knowledge is in governance. So I asked my council to incorporate Election, uh, having an election at the high school, having two individuals represent the youth in our community on our student council. That was successful. We have not, we have been having students. We just swore in our two youth uh, last week at council for this year. We've had that successful program for now 12 years. And we're really the envy of the province of, for communities that say we got youth engagement. So we really, I see the changes in, uh, about my leadership. My leadership is, own, is very honest and open and direct. And uh, I've seen more of that that's my big scene and changes over the years in regards to the councils from the original 90s when I first got elected. It was a lot more behind the scenes and, you know, we weren't televised. We, we uh, Actually, our council has been televised for a better part of almost 30 years live, even back in the 90s. We were live. And and when you're live, it's unique because you don't have any any uh, opportunity to pull that back. Right. So there was some heated debates uh, on many different nights, let me tell you. So a lot of changes. And I'm really pleased with the changes uh, to my council. And of course, uh, my leadership was more working with our administration team. I, I want to pick up on something that you said there. And I want to talk about sure. apathy within a community, because when I sit down with mayors like yourself and across this country, I'm hearing about an apathy when it comes to a municipal politics, not provincial because that's sexy with partisan politics, not yeah. federal because that's even more sexy with partisan politics, but municipal, you don't get the uh, attention that uh, provincial and federal politics. Why do you think that is? Why do you think for those 10 years, you didn't see people come into those open houses? Because I would have been there, but that's just me. And I'm one of those nerds who sure. likes municipal politics. Sure. And we did have a few of those individuals, but the reality was, we we went through a growth period in the eighties with we had a big boom here with the with the Hemlo Gold Fields. So in that boom, we we experienced uh, you know the community went from about two thousand people to six thousand people, and you know we had portables all over the schools and everything. So there was a lot of debt. Well, nineteen ninety one, we got on council. There was a huge amount of debt that was unfinanced. So we then took it on. We got uh, then Bob Gray was a premier of Ontario. We got a, a temporary uh, no interest loan from him to get. We couldn't even meet payroll. That's how bad it was. We put a freeze on all the spending. So then when we got out of that that scenario in 2001, we, we really focused on how we would run the municipality with a very tight, uh, you know, handle on the purse strings and keep taxes and water and, and fees in check. And, you know, honestly, we, we we moved forward with small increase each and every year, but there were, there were increases based on the work we were performing and the equipment we needed. We didn't go extravagant. We went through that process. No blame to any councils. They had to grow. They just did it too fast and and. Un unfinanced uh, scenario but the reality is we going forward this my councils have always been very keen on the the presenting uh, a fair and equitable budget to the municipality so the apathy i feel is that yeah you know it's there because there's not much happening in the municipal level but every once in a while when we get an like for example we we had uh, a you know water increase base uh, one year we had to go up quite quite dramatically to put a reserve in we had some major problems well that that then you know people get out in the community and they're really up in arms but overall, in general, uh, the apathy comes from really not much happening at our level. Everybody's happy. We've got a small budget. We run anywhere from six to twelve million, depending on capital. Uh, we keep taxes in check. We have a very safe community. Um, you know, so great economics. Uh, there's not much unemployment. If you're if you're not working, you really don't want to work. So yeah, there's a there's a lot of things that are going on that are positive. So I believe in small communities that does lead to that. I did a great story on CBC about the apathy as well, and then why nobody's running for mayors. Well, I think that was part of the social media aspect where people are getting beat up constantly. No matter what you do or what you say, you're getting beat up on social media. So people are just saying, hey, I'm not I'm running a small business. I'm a small business guy or gal and I want to uh, participate and be involved. But yet I'm getting beat up on, on social media. So I'm just not going to bother. I'm not going to make that that difference in my community. So a lot of times I see them getting involved in the, the subcommittees of councils. But yeah, the apathy is there, and I I, I I can't really put a finger on it, but I I guess my explanation there was probably the best I can give you. 
while uh, you talk about the apathy when people put their names towards for elections, now you have been acclaimed uh, four out of the last five elections as mayor. Um, I, I got to ask, because it's kind of a double-edged sword, it's great that you don't have to run against somebody, but would you prefer if you had to actually run against someone and be able to get those ideas flowing and have that exchange of ideas where people are b- making the best foot forward for the town and saying, you know what, I think your ideas are wrong, I think my ideas are better, and let's put it to the voters to decide. And at the end of the day, if my what my decide my side wins, then it's great. If your side wins, even better. Who cares? Because right. at the end of the day, it's all for the betterment of the community. Uh, absolutely, I, I attend every one of the delegate the the the, the uh, council's delegation nights where they have the question and answers and the quiz from the public. And uh, I, I attend all those. I talk to each one of the members who are running for council, and I certainly do wish encourage people. And I might my, my some of my council members have thought and asked me if I was still going to run. They didn't want to run against me. And I, I don't know if that just feels that because I have, uh, you know, a huge support in the community. And I, and I think my role as mayor and because of my uh, accessibility and open, honest approach, I, I talk to everybody anywhere, anytime, you know, in the store, on the phone, uh, you name it. I, you know, I even got myself in trouble a little bit last year, a year and a half ago. Or so when, uh, when I went to some people's homes and explained the facts to them about council, but, uh, the, some 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 of the individuals didn't really like that that visit, but that's the reality. That's my personality. So uh, you know, as far as uh, that individual is running against me, I certainly do encourage it, and I and I I'm, I ask some of my younger members of council to really focus on what's that look like for them when I'm done. I mean, I will all be done eventually, and I you know my time is is going to come uh, w- whether it's the next election or not, Chris. I can't really say. I I'm still passionate about the job. That's the one key thing that keeps me involved. I'm involved with. Uh, Northwestern Ontario Municipal Association, as well as I sit on the AMO Board of Directors for the Ontario Province. I, I'm really involved. I'm a, I'm a member of the Police Services Board. Uh, I, I'm the president of Thunder Bay District Municipal League. I'm involved because I'm passionate about the local politics and the governance. And as you say, there's not much excitement in municipal, but we try to bring that that municipal level to the provincial government. Say, hey, listen, here we are in Northwestern Ontario. We want to hear our voice to be heard in some of the issues we have, uh, uh, you know, they're presenting us with uh, with some issues in our part of the uh, province. So, uh, yeah, that that is something I wish I, w- I would have against me and challenge me on that, because I would certainly give my uh, my uh, opinion on those those roles. But I also feel very confident that the community with nobody running against me feels that they're quite comfortable with my leadership. Now, over the last 17 years as mayor, you've had to make some pretty tough choices, I'm assuming. You've had to make some very tough uh, decisions that impact your residents. And I say that because you know, after your time in office, that municipal governments make the biggest impact the day after you make the decisions. Not like the Ontario government where it could take a month, two months, three months. A federal government could take a year, 10 years, who knows. But municipalities, you make a decision, it impacts them. How do you balance that to make, and I'm quoting you here, fair and equitable community for everyone because i can imagine sometimes you have to and i'm not trying to i'm not trying to put you on the spot here but i can imagine these are the tough decisions you have to make because a fair community is great but you know the reality that sometimes not everyone's going to get what they want or not everyone's going to get their fair share of what they want absolutely but you know the reality is i think when you sit down and i and i and that's when i say about getting myself in a little bit of trouble with going to people's homes because i feel comfortable about doing that but the reality is I'll sit down with anybody anytime, make time for them. And, and on their on their terms, on you know, I gotta work. I I retired now, but I had to work, I had a real job, and I had to go and, and do my service. And after the day, I would go and talk to anybody, deal with anything. There are there are situations where you have to make those tough decisions. But the reality, sorry, the reality is is you elected me, well, in my case, claimed over the last uh, four elections, but prior to that, or the council members to make those decisions. I want to give you a real, a real uh, recent one that we had to make a really tough decision on. We have a facility, our, our indoor pool, arena, and theater complex. We started the process in 2016, Chris, to build a new facility. So this process takes long. So we had public consultations. We had five public consultations. We even went to our First Nations neighbors who utilize our community for a lot of recreation, health, and uh, shopping and education systems. So we went to them, asked their opinion on this new build. Then we start looking at dollars. Well, when we still originally looked at that, there was no availability with the government, federal, provincial infrastructure funds. So we said, okay, let's continue to focus on this and look at getting more, so put more money each year in budget to get more of a more detailed draft plan, uh, design concept. We did all that. We found location. 
we got everything worked out. We went back to the municipality in 2022, you know, just at the end of the pandemic. Said, okay, here we are. We're at about 56 million, roughly to 64, depending on someone's wish list items. But we're going to look at this through 23. When I put $500,000 into the budget, get to the final details of drawings. Well, in the same time, our pool has been having issues around uh, the deterioration of rust on the beams and all that over the years. We knew this scenario was happening, but then lo and behold, we have to make the decision to shut the pool down because the engineer says clearly that the building is now not suitable for public occupancy. Well, of course, now the community gets in an uproar and we made the decision and they want to have public meetings and want to do, you know, thus to explain what happened. And I said, no, the reality is we shut the pool down based on a professional engineer's report on the structure of that facility. And if I don't know if you're familiar with the LA Lake scenario where the engineer approved it as well, two people died and several other people got injured from a, a roof caving in on a parking garage. We don't want that scenario to happen in our community. So we made that tough decision. Well, it really caused a lot of, uh, um, you know, uh, uproar in the community and a lot of discussion around social media and all that. I met with everybody who wanted to chat with me about this scenario. So is it fair and equitable? Is it uh, um, an open concept? Absolutely. Totally open. Explain the situation. And every one of those individuals I spoke to directly and explained the shape. And, the, you know, they wanted to see pictures. They want to see their engineering report. We said no, 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 because that would just continue to create more controversy. Because the guy who looks at the picture says, well, you know, I'm a grade, uh, grade 12 student and I'm uh, uh, not an engineer, but I think that beam could be fixed. Well, no, not necessarily. That engineer is designed. He went to school for that and they structurally said the building was not suitable. So you know what I mean? It continues to create more uh, more debate around the decision we made. We made a decision. It's done. And guess what? In about a week, like any decision you make that are tough, they go away. And then we get on to the next form of business, you know, dealing with the budget, whatever it is. And that's reality. And I mean, that's the way I've been always governing. And people respect that. And so when I say to them at the end of the day, from my council's point of view, an administration report or an engineer or an architect or consultant, we are giving you the best information possibly to make a decision at the table. Remember, and I said this to many of those people, I use the pool five days a week with my grandkids, myself, my wife. We utilize the pool. So we're, we're you know, participants in that facility where a lot of the people who are making criticisms never walked into the pool in many, many years. So, you know, I kind of weigh that out and say, listen, here it is. But that's how I approach it. And, you know, I'm going to want to just quickly touch on everything. We had a, a student council last year who was a trans uh, individual. So we had to learn about that process. You know, so here's a student counselor, 17 years of age and going through the process of, of transition. Well, we asked for them to uh, to give us an overview and understanding of that. We made mistakes, many of them, but we apologized and we said at the beginning, we're going to make mistakes how we approach it. We asked the individual to come to our NOMA AGM in the spring, this spring 23, April 23, to do the presentation. There was about 230 delegates, 10 ministers there at that meeting. And guess what? It went over really well, and everybody was really appreciative of understanding how this individual is moving forward in the transition of, of their life and about understanding about how all of us, older folks, uh, understand how this affects us and how life go goes on. So it's a, it was a good learning curve, and we brought it to the forefront by saying, hey, we want you to make sure that you're fully uh, supported by our council to bring this to the rest of the members of our region to say, listen, you know, we can all work together, right? You've mentioned the word respect a lot over the last five minutes in this conversation, and right. I want to ask this question because I think this is the important question when it talks about uh, engagement. How important is it to be respectful in engagement and understand that not everyone is going to agree with the decisions you make, but you have to respectfully give them five, ten minutes of your time yeah. and then have to do it in a respectful manner, not swearing at you, not yelling your name and not cursing your name. But do it in a respectful manner where you have to say, okay, I'm your mayor. I've been I've been acclaimed by you. No one's run against me. But as your representative, as the person who's leading council, I have to respect you enough to be able to let you vent to me about the decisions I've made. Absolutely. And that is one of our own logos in the municipality, but it's also my personal one's respect. And I'm, listen, I'm not perfect and I make mistakes. And that's We all do. Where no, one's, no one's perfect. Absolutely. And I try to do my best and I try to listen to everybody and listen is the key whether you like my response and again my response is honest and and forward there's no bs it's here it is here's why we made the decision and i live it i live here i pay taxes i pay water i ride the streets i run over the potholes i get my garbage picked up by this town staff i utilize the facilities just like you do and the golf course greens are not in good shape i play on the golf course and i get a bad putt and i right yeah i'm mad but I, i'm out golfing it's a wonderful day how how, how bad is it 
So I do respect everybody's opinion and listen, and I try to give it back a, a view from council, not not me, Rick, but council. And and where the individual I went to, the one I went to many homes that day, the one I, I raised my voice. I certainly did because I was so passionate about the issue at hand, which was the lowering of flags, which we didn't have to under the protocol, but we recognized the 215 uh, uh, grave sites that were found in Kamloops. We just wanted to respect our First Nations neighbors by lowering the flag. We didn't do it right, I guess, from the public's point of view or fast enough, which we didn't have to in the first place because a flag protocol is very serious. But I went to explain all this stuff to the individuals, and the one individual didn't like my my answer so then i got excited and i raised my voice and i sincerely so that in that case i wasn't respectful of the individual but at the same time i was but i was so excited and passionate about the the debate i raised my voice that's how i got in trouble no no language just raising my voice I, I, I thank you for being candor about this because yeah. I, I traditionally don't do a lot of research. I just try to learn who when you get elected first off. So this yeah. is not something I set up. To, this these are just questions that I traditionally ask. Yeah. But I want to turn now because I'm cautious of time here and I'm cautious of uh, your time as well. I want to turn to the town now. I want to turn to the town of Marathon as a whole. But before I ask these questions, I'm going to preface this segment by saying this. This is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a motion sure. of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not a policy of council. This is the mayor's opinion. While he's the chair of the council, this is his opinion at, on this show. I want to start with this question, and this is the big one. In your opinion, as of recording this episode, what do you see as the biggest issue or issues facing your community today? Well, that's a good one, but I think more than anything, as I'm going to go for my role as a, as a mayor in this community for sure, but as my my more bigger, broader role as, you know, I sit on the Thunder Bay District, Municipal League, NOMA, and AMO, is mental health has got to be the number one issue that's facing my community. We don't have a big issue with homelessness in my community, but mental health and homelessness is, is a big one, and addiction. So I have the mental health and addictions for sure, but in my smaller communities, and we live in the northern part of the province where it's a little cooler, like today I woke up and it was snowing out, and uh, you know it was cool, it was minus three, but the reality is we don't have the homelessness issue, but my neighboring communities do, like the city of Thunder Bay, you know, Kenora, you know, Dryden. I go south, uh, Sault Ste. Marie, you know, uh, Sudbury, those communities where they're bigger, there's more individuals who are not sheltered properly. So the mental health addictions are number one and two for sure. And and is it always been on the forefront, Chris? I believe so, but it's been more open now because more and more people are experiencing more mental health and, and addictions because of the lifestyle that's been impacted on them. And I, again, I can only speak, I can't speak for America because it's happening with the mental health and addictions, but on a smaller micro scale, but on a bigger scale from the region, it's it's much more much more dramatic. Um, you know, our crime rate is very minimal in Marathon. As I said on the police services board, you know, we have crime like everybody else, but it's very minimal. And and we work with people. I I work with people. If I see somebody struggling, I talk to them and I try to you know see if they need help. How how can I assist? But I'm going to say that's got to be number one. Uh, you know, in all of our, our locations, our economic base is pretty strong. Um, you know, we're we're pretty good. We're we're a wealthy community. We got lots of. Uh, you know, opportunities, recreational, you know, things to do. Uh, for a small northern community, we got a lot of things going on. People come and say, oh, there's not much going on. Well, there's not much going on in the big city either. Unless you got a lot of money, you're going to take part in the, you know, in the opera and the theater and the hockey games and the baseball games. But that's the reality. You know, you got to have the money. Well, when you're living in a big city, you, you got to pay most of your money for your, your housing if you can afford it, right? So that is not a big thing for marathon in regards to the the overall homelessness but the mental health and addictions on a bigger scale for my region mental health addictions and homelessness is one of the biggest things secondly marathon has been blessed since 1995 with doctors we have eight docs at any given time which is amazing for a community of about 3500 people my, my a lot of my neighboring communities in the northwest region in northern ontario are struggling to to attract and retain docs and i just met with the the president of nossum uh last week in thunder bay and the biggest thing is a lot of docs are not going into family practice. And if they are, they have nowhere in Northern Ontario to do the residencies at the hospitals. So they're heading back South. And when they're heading South, they're meeting up with partners for, you know, uh, you know uh, relationships are built, uh, lifestyles, whatever that case might be, they're being attracted to those communities. They're going back to them after they're, they're done their education. So I know it's a long winded response, Chris, but that's what I see what's happening in my, my neighborhood. 
No, but I am very glad it's long winded because I want to pick up on the first part, mental sure. health and addictions. Now, earlier this year, I had the pleasure to sit down with Mayor Wendy, Lar- uh, Wendy. Oh, my God, I, I can't for- remember her name right now from Sunia uh, out, yeah, just around the corner. Yeah, Mayor Wendy there. Landry from Sunia. Landry. Yeah. There you go. I want to call yeah. her Landris, yeah. but it wasn't Landry. And she talked about mental health and addiction as well. And I, I, I got to sort of poke the bear a little bit here, but this is not a municipal issue. While it is affecting municipalities, mental health and addiction is a provincial issue. And the province, yep. and it might have changed since I talked to uh, Wendy earlier this year, but has the province come to the table to say, we're going to help you. We're going to help municipalities deal with this mental health and addictions in smaller communities. Because traditionally, they look at Thunder Bay, they look at Dryden, they look at Kenora. They don't look at the smaller towns and villages that are dealing with these issues. They look at the larger hubs. So are you seeing support from the provincial government right now? So as of yet, not yet, uh, Chris, and I think we've identified that many different times. Wendy Landry is the president of NOMA. I sit as the executive vice president of NOMA as well. So we sit at the same table when we, when we meet with government. We just came back from London, Ontario, and talked to, to the ministers and made that very, very point about uh, the mental health and addictions and homelessness in our part of the world. And it's not just us, like I stated earlier, it's it's all throughout the province. We're asking the government to focus on that. And as you know, they, they have a lot on their plate, and I respect that. But we always come to to those meetings with a, with a solution, and no different than the meeting in London. We talked about the solutions, and there's ideals that we can present through different agencies in our in our part of the, the province that can work with them. But of course, like anything, it's all about funding. You know, and, uh, and the government's got to you know move the, the monies around a little bit differently and maybe and help uh, assist and, and, and I'm going to say, honestly, I think a lot of things, too, is that, you know, there's a lot of people there's not going into the workplace to support individuals who need those helps. Like, I mean, that's reality. Like, it's not just in that field, but in all fields. Like, I'm, I'm, I can't believe my community, when I say about economically, I got guys who are crying for employees, can't find nobody for small, you know, uh, uh, 22 to $25 jobs doing, you know, handiwork or, you know, construction work around town. It's like crazy. So when you're looking at people to be, cons- you know, to be counselors and, and working with individuals on mental health and day-to-day ideas. And listen, at the end of the day, when I said we bring solutions, you know, one of the things we talked about a lot with government was, you know, when you have, uh, you know, a non-closed officer uh, in a cop car who deals with mental health. Well, individuals who have mental health and addictions, they don't want to see a uniformed person come and talk to them when they're having problems. So we need more of those people in cars. Yes, they're going to be trained under the Police Act, but they're also maybe not full police officers, maybe just you know counselors working with police officers to go and deal with those people who are in crisis. That will relieve a lot of pressures on going to now. You get an officer who goes to the individual and who has a breakdown. Now there's some some violence involved, maybe, or there's a breakdown of the mental health individual going in now to the hospital. Now he's got two cops sitting in the hospital. It goes on and on and on. So those dollars keep exploding. And if you took that and, and said, okay, let's focus on putting some people in the cars, putting more people on the on the uh, street, dealing with day-to-day activities, checking up on individuals. My little community, I know most of the people who are having problems, not directly 100% personally, but I know of them and who they are. If we have people going and checking on them a couple of times a week, how are you doing? How are you you're, you're taking your meds? Are you, is your cupboard full of food? Uh, is your rent being paid? Whatever those cases or scenarios are, those individuals are bringing down, that might save a lot of pressures on the upstream of our, our healthcare and policing systems that, you know, it's a, it's a cycle thing. And that's amazing. Maybe, maybe I'm talking silly, but those are the, some of the solutions we try to bring to government. But I want to pick up on something there because you, you mentioned something that is very key to this conversation, the people of the community. And that is yep. the part where I think a lot of people forget about. You can ask the province to help. You can ask the federal government to ask. You as the municipality can help out. But if you don't have buy-in from the community to get together and work and help people who are struggling with mental health and addiction, with bringing in services, with setting up services or even support groups, um, then it doesn't work. Do you see people wanting to help out in your community say, okay, we need to pitch in because John down the street is struggling right now or Sarah's down the street is struggling and we need to check in on them. And maybe it's once a week that someone goes over to their house, knocks on the door and say, how are you? How can I help you? So I know for sure in my community that's happening on not on all cases, but it's happening and people are checking up on people and there's like different service agencies that are out there doing it without being funded by the government. That's because we live in a small community. Rest assured yeah. that doesn't happen everywhere. We know that that's reality. It's not happening in bigger centers because there's no direct contact and knowing of Sarah or John or whoever's in, in, a, in a bit of situation or struggling, you know, so, so, 
Can we get more, uh, you know, government support? Yes. Can government focus on that? Yes. How do we get that? But then they're they're being pulled at all the other different areas. Like, and we just had an announcement here in our community of a 14 bed long term care facility. We know our community is aging, like every other community in Ontario, probably that for, for that matter of Canada. But we're not having babies, and yet everybody I talk to, listen, they talk about all these brown people coming to our country. I support them. Let's come more, come over here because we need them to support our infrastructure, our jobs our future in regards to our social systems. If we don't have people, we will be really struggling in another decade or two. So we need immigration. We need brown people to come. We need people from all over the world to come to Canada and say, here I am. I'm willing to work. I'm willing to bring a, a service or sector. So yeah, I don't know. Uh, maybe maybe some more of those people that are coming in as immigrants can come and help and help in our systems. And government has to focus on what are those are. So long-term care facility in our community is being great. Now, after the pandemic, PSWs were really uh, in short short supply. We had a program in our community and throughout the, the region, and it filled a lot of those gaps. Then the government takes away the money they were giving an additional fund for uh, the PSWs and reduce their wages. Why would you do that? You know, why not just keep that wages there, keep those individuals in that support role and have those people being uh, being uh, helped out that need to help. And those PSWs could have been people, some of the people could have went and checked on some of those individuals in our communities are having mental health and addictions problems and seeing how they're making out an hour a week, uh, you know, or twice a week, an hour a day, you know, all funded by the government. What? What's going You know, those are simple things, but... Hey, there's a lot of big fish in the frying pan to fry, and I understand it, but you know, take it down to a macro level, and and it can just continue to grow from that level. So I want to take it down even closer to a macro, my, my sure. macro level here, if, if that's okay, because um, you you've just laid out three priorities that you see are issues within the town of Marathon. But if I was to hypothetically be in the town of Marathon in August of this year, and I was at yep. Pebble Beach, and there was a few people down at the beach and talking, and I happened to overhear and started a conversation with them and asked them what they thought was the biggest issue, they wouldn't yep. have told me those. They would have told me yep. some other issues. And yep. I and I and I say this because everyone has their own issues that they uh, are dealing with. Some talked about infrastructure some talked about the yeah. road disrepaired some talked about parks some talked about like you said earlier there's not much things to do in marathon and i have to go to thunder bay or i have to go out of town to do something how do you balance that aspect of the job because you want to try to make sure everyone's issue is important but you have to look at the every issue as a town issue as a marathon issue not as a john issue or a sarah issue it's a marathon issue so how do you make sure that people feel like they are their issues are being addressed. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny because, you know, the reality is I travel a lot and I tell all my residents this and I'm an ambassador for my community. And I think if they really sincerely look right down deep and dirty into the, the comments they make, they 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 could be a huge ambassador to the community as well and talk about those very wonderful, positive things we have going on in our community. Yes. Is our shopping lacking? Absolutely. I mean, you know, as a retailer, I was in business for many years. As a retailer, it's hard to service a small population with the variety of things you would get in a big city. Fully understand and appreciate that. You know, we have a few restaurants. Could we have a few more? Sure. We need entrepreneurs to get involved with those. But as far as your road maintenance, road repairs, you know, uh, shoveling, uh, your, your, your plowing in the winter, parks in the summer, we have the most amazing outdoor parks in our neighborhood, in our backyard. With Pebble Beach, as you've seen, it was under construction for, for the enhancement of that. We had to cut that back, obviously, due to COVID uh, increases in supply chains. We had a bunch of other things planned there, but, you know, the budget came in too high. We have the beautiful boat launch with slips. We have a fish cleaning station and we have Penn Lake Park with, you know, 18 fully serviced cable, sewer, water, electrical. I mean, it's number one. You go on TripAdvisor and that's everybody talks about this wonderful park when they come to the community. Maybe members of the community. I use it. I go there, camp there with my grandkids on special days, Canada Day, fireworks days, uh, you know, different uh, different events that are happening there. Uh, we have a Nays Provincial Park about 20 kilometers from us. We have White Lake Provincial Park about 45 kilometers. We have Puckasaw National Park 15 kilometers. We have trails that are Trans Canada, the Heritage Trail, the Group of Seven Trail systems that we've been developed over the last seven to 10 years that are amazing. But you got to get out and you got to enjoy them. Or you can well, sit in your house. 
I think it's always the grass is greener on the other side, right? Because sure. people always look at their own community and go, oh, okay, it's my community. I've been here for 50 years. And trust me, I, I live in a big city. I go, there's nothing to do here on a Friday night. But it's what you make of it at the end of the day. And I completely understand that. The, the, what I was getting at, though, is that everyone believes that their issue is the most important issue to them. Sure. And you yeah. have to grow the city, but you know that there's not limited supply of money every year that you can't go do everyone's wants and needs and dreams that they have for the community. And you have to pick and choose. Is it hard to say no to people in a respectful manner to say, unfortunately, your issue, your pothole, your park upgrade, we would love to do it. Just right now, we have to worry about X, Y, and Z because these are more pressing issues for the town as a whole. Absolutely. But I, that's why I would encourage more people to get involved because I could tell you, like my time in council, so I'm almost 30 years now, Chris, again, with that open door policy, even an opportunity for delegations, you know, budget meetings. Budget meetings are open to the public every year, each and every year. We just started our process last week for the 24 budget. Nobody comes out and listens and talks about it, puts input in about whether they want some potholes fixed, the roads fixed, the park fixed, nothing. And that's the encouragement of those things that we want people to be participating in. So the odd one or two people might come out and make comment or maybe send us an email from time to time. But listen, I hate to say no to anybody, but the reality is I pay taxes and I understand the impact it has on everybody. So we got to make sure that we have a staff that provides a service because everybody knows if you wanted to have the services that are provided to the, in our community, specifically, we have great services. You're going to pay. If you want to reduce those taxes, you're going to reduce services. You're going to start shutting facilities down. Maybe we get rid of one grader. We only have one grader on the road. It doesn't get plowed till two o'clock in the afternoon. People, people really understand that the impact would be great if it was there, but we try to say yes to almost everything we possibly can within reason and make sure that we have a healthy, safe community that everybody can enjoy. And at the end of the day, we're not going to please everybody. I'm not always pleased, but I try to work with everybody within the community to make sure that we're all living a safe, comfortable lifestyle that we can come and go as we please, do we like. We look around the world, what's happening all over us. Chris, you know, and I, I just really stop bitching yeah. about things. Just, you know, participate, go out and enjoy it and, and really think about how lucky you are. So I, I, I've been accused on this show of being too negative in this part of the segment and talking about the issues. I want to talk about the accomplishments for a second before we turn to my last segment. And I, I, I want to ask this sort of overarching question, and you can take as long as you want to answer this. But what do you see as the thing or things that are happening in uh, Marathon that you can point to and say, you know what? People may be bitching, complaining, as you say, but at the end of the day, we have this, we have that, we have a great service. You talk about the doctors, we have doctors in our community, others. What are the accomplishments as mayor that you boast about when people, you talk to other mayors around your area? Well, you just hit the nail on the head, I think, on every one of them. So I, I talk about our great doc system. Listen, I'm going to tell you, in 1995, I was the then chair of the finance committee. I kicked the docs out of our clinic. In 1995, because reality was they were costing us a at that point, $350,000. We had him in a clinic system. We then worked with another doc who came back to the community, set him up and helped him work in setting up a clinic. And from that point forward, we worked with the docs. We still have a retention and recruitment officer work. We fund with that, with the healthcare system, as well as our corporate citizens. We listen, I believe all the accomplishments I have completed in the community is, is the infrastructure, the safe and well-being lifestyle, the services that are provided. The low taxes that you pay, the quality of life, everything that everybody wants when you get out of bed in the morning and go outside. Well, you know, we're gonna you're gonna be in a cranky mood some days for sure. But the reality is everything that you want is here in the community. And if you want it, listen, I always say when I'm an ambassador out there and I'm in, in Toronto, like you know, I go there quite regularly and I talk about I try to encourage people to come up here in Northern Ontario because I can afford and listen, pre-COVID, you could buy a house in Maryland for a hundred grand. After COVID, they went up to like 250, 300. I mean, that's just the reality. People were moving around. But imagine making a hundred grand a year and living in a house in Marathon, a beautiful house, you know, uh, three to four bedrooms, big garage for hundred grand, great lifestyle. Even at two and three hundred grand, it's a hell of a deal. So my accomplishment is like, it's quality of life, great dog systems, good recreation activities. Yeah, we had to shut our pool down this year because of that. We we're one of the only small communities in northwestern Ontario of our size with an indoor pool. We've always kept it open because. Yeah, it's a white elephant, but the reality is it brought a quality of life for us during the long winters. So we kept that open as a council. 
We had to shut it down. No, not we didn't want to, but that's reality. We're looking at building a new active living center, which is about fifty-six million dollars. We're hoping to go to tender in twenty-four. That will be my legacy. Hopefully, if I can get that, but I want to make sure it's done properly. And we're not going to have no debt that the municipal I can't afford when I'm long gone and I'm up on the hill and the daisies are growing over me. The reality is, I want to make sure that it's done right, and I made it very clear with council to our administration that we will do it right. We'll make sure we have the funding, both provincially, federally, or our corporate citizens to help out and we'll go forward from that. So my accomplishments as a mayor is simply just the everyday activities we've been providing to the community as a safe, uh, vibrant, uh, uh, low cost uh, place to live in Northern Ontario. And you can get on an airplane and travel the world in short three hours in Thunder Bay because you can afford to do that. People do it all the time here. They're all over the place. They can travel to the Caribbean, to Southern Ontario, to be the East Coast, West Coast. We have a lot of Newfoundlanders live here. They get a chance to go home quite quite often because they can afford to do that because of the cost of living. So, uh, I want to turn to my last segment because I'm cautious mm. of time here. And I want to talk sure. about my favorite subject, and that's tourism. And I we, we yes. touched on a little bit already, mm. but I want to go in a little bit deeper now. And as someone who came to your community, and the only reason, I, I will be honest here, and I'll be upfront, the only mm. reason I stopped in your community is because your beautiful marathon signs. I saw yep. them while I was driving through from uh, Manitoba to Thunder Bay, uh, to Sault Ste. Marie, sorry. And I kept on seeing this big giant sign that said marathon. And I was trying to figure out what, what, what it was all about. So that's why I actually stopped in because it was off the beaten path a little bit. But I wanted to take a moment and say, okay, I need to know, learn a little bit more about marathon. And I'm happy I did. So why should people visit marathon? What are the tourist attractions that you promote on a regular basis? I know you've talked about them already, but are there some that you just want people to know? about and those hidden gems that even if you are coming through northern ontario you need to stop in marathon for x certainly i mean you know the reality is those signs were put up by the uh, the council in the early 2000s we wanted to promote marathon as a destination we consider ourselves as the hub of the north shore because we're the bigger community with more amenities but that's not what it's going to attract you here Tourism in Marathon is driven a lot by by the uh, the economic tourism, which is the construction uh, support for the mining sector. But we also have a lot of tourists coming here for the Group of Seven systems. Group of Seven is big with the trail system, and you got to be into it. I got residents in my community that have never never even been near the trails. But yet we got people from all over the world coming here to visit our trail system for the group of seven. We're continually building on that each and every year. We give money to the group of seven trail committee through working through the McMichael gallery and the group of seven committee. And it's amazing the different locations that they painted through the 1920s, 33s. That's a big tourist attraction. We had a great big uh, splash we're going to do with, uh, with the McMichael gallery and, uh, and, and down in Toronto, but COVID hit and we had to cancel. So we did a smaller scale one after COVID and uh, I talk about the outdoor amenities, you know, great Lake Superior is wonderful from from BN, which is Heron Bay Pick River, the mouth of the Pick River, all the way to Nays Provincial Park. There's a trail system now you can walk, you can enjoy it. It's part of the Trans Canada, it's part of the Harris Trail System, tied in with the Group of Seven. It's signed very well. You know, the Penn Lake Park is a beautiful spot to come and relax right in the middle of town. You think you're in the middle of the woods, which you are, but you're right in the middle of the center of town as well. Um, you know, just the friendliness. And listen, I get a lot of comments back about the community, the friendliness of the people, you know, the the ability for them to to welcome you, to come into the community and and assist you in any way. Uh, I, I, I don't know what else. Like everything that we have in our community is to attract tourism is about the outdoors. We have a wonderful ski facility, cross country ski facility. We had world-class training for, uh, teams come to Marathon and train here for Olympics. You know, it's a it's a lit five kilometer at nighttime, and it's about I think there's 25 total kilometers of trail systems that are very challenging. They have three different colors. I can I'm only doing green. I might do a little bit of blue, but the the blue and red are like amazing world class tra uh, trails. Uh, we have uh, we had a downhill ski club, but we had to close it up because of the uh, the changing in demographics. You know, we know kids mostly ski, but we share with our neighboring communities, Terrace Bay and, and Manitowoc, with ski hills. So we promote them as well as they promote us. And listen, at the end of the day, it's all about us working together and come to the great, you know, shoreline of Lake Superior. You know, if you're down at Pebble, you've seen Pebble Beach. Pebble Beach is a world-class uh, location. There's only a couple of them on the Lake Superior uh, shoreline. And that's amazing. And the rock hounds that come, once it's all done too, as well, it's good. so it's going to be completed, completed this month, but a little behind the schedule. People come from all over the world, believe it or not. And I've talked to many, many people picking up rocks. 
you know, because they love that. So that just that alone is a great tourist attraction. But honestly, it's just about the great outdoors and the, the great amenities we have. And we we just are in completion of another a hotel facility. And we're looking, there's a, a participant looking at building another. So we're, we're building more availability of room space as well as, uh, as a, you know, the whole availability of getting out in the campsite areas where the Pebble Beach was incorporated for another 10 campsites. We had to cut that back and continue to look at 24. So it's about the destination of the hub. And the golf course is an amazing Stanley Thompson design. Beautiful nine-hole course. Uh, just love it. And the price is really cheap. So, yeah, I encourage anybody to come to our community for golfing, skiing, walking, talking, hanging out. Uh, uh, just another friendly visit. I, I would, I'm going to echo your sentiments there because uh, as a, a former visitor of the community, I'm going to come back because I want to go do some of these trails as well. But um, I had some of the most friendliest conversations and they didn't know me from Adam and people just right. stopped what they were doing and were uh, helpful in helping me get around the community. While it's not a big community, uh, it's still when you're a newcomer and you don't really have good cell reception because your cell provider is not the best in Northern Ontario, <laughs> you have to rely on the kindness of strangers. So the people of Marathon, God bless them. I, I highly suggest that people go and your administration staff. I just want to put that on the, uh, the table here because your administration staff went over and above at 11.55 when I was coming in for the lunch hour when they looked like they were trying to get to lunch. So thank you to them. So I want to end on my last question. It's an important question. And it's the million dollar question to end this entire interview. And take as long as you want, because I think every municipal leader knows how to answer this. But at the end of the day, I want to put it on the record. What makes the town of Marathon such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Well, that's that's a really loaded question. There's a there's a hundred things I can think of, but the reality is we were built on paper lace with gold as our logo. Uh, my dad worked in the mill. My brothers worked in the mill. I worked in the mill before I went to business. This community was built on on the mill, the the pulp and paper mill, and ran right through till two thousand and nine. Went bankrupt. We shut her down. Uh, we cleaned up the property. We took over the property. We're working on a port authority. Um, you know, Marathon, honestly, is just one of those little gems. And I think every mayor will say the same thing about their community, but it's a little gem that's a friendly community. We've, we, especially growing the way we did in the 80s. And I remember sitting down across with some of the Newfoundlanders in a coffee shop in the early days. And I was a business guy. I wasn't in, in municipal governance, playing hockey with them and playing golf. And, you know, they're all like, oh, we're going back to Newfoundland when we're going to finish up work here at the Hemlo Gold Fields, right? And I go, oh, yeah, I'm like, you know, that's too bad. You know, it'd be a nice place to stay here. Why don't you retire here? And this is back when we're in our 30s, and I wasn't even thinking about retirement. I mean, you know, and uh, lo and behold, I retired. They all retired here. Their kids are working in the mines, and the mine is still operating very, very good. It should, it's got a life of mine, uh, 2039. We have a potential palladium uh, copper mine uh, right in our municipal boundaries, uh, hopefully start construction in early 24. So what makes Marathon a great place? Honestly, just the people, the people, the people. And I encourage anybody, instead of, like I said this in the interview, instead of complaining about something, participate in something, get involved and be the ambassador that, that we'd all want you to be when you're out in the other parts of the world. And I think most people in general, and I'm, I'm no different than you, Chris, and you're from, coming from your community, you say where you live, you typically talk it up about your town somewhat. You know, I don't typically ever, <laughs> I never really met anybody who was super negative about their town. Yeah, they might be negative on a few things about their town, but so the most people are kind of ambassadors without them even knowing they're ambassadors about their municipality. But I would encourage more people to talk about those wonderful things we have, to talk about the lifestyle, the friendliness, the even as simple as healthcare, you know, how wonderful that is when you don't have to leave your community in most cases to have healthcare. You know, yeah, we need to go to the city for surgeries and big things happening, no doubt, and then big hospitals but or shopping but you can do a lot of those things right here so all in all i listen i was born and raised in marathon i'm going to die i'm going to be buried up on a hill and um i'm i'm going to encourage anybody else who lives here to feel the same way that feels the same way to get that word out there about how wonderful our community is and it's a gem in northwestern ontario it certainly is. Rick, it is an honor and a pleasure to meet you, to chat with you and spend the last 45 minutes with each other. Uh, thank you so much for serving your community and thank you so much for sitting down with this uh, chat because I think we just scratched the surface and next time I'm through Marathon, which will be the next summer, when I head off to AMO, I'll, I'll look you up and we'll hopefully grab a coffee before I have oh, to absolutely. continue to drive and you probably fly out to AMO. <laughs> 
No, you know what's funny? I just I drove down to Amo through the states this year, and I I drive down because a lot of times for me going backwards is more of a hassle. Chris, I got to go back to Thunder Bay, sit in the airport two three hours. I can leave here, be in Toronto in ten and a half hours. So if it's in Toronto or Ottawa, it's not bad. London was a little bit harder, but then you go through the states. I was there in ten hours, so it's all good, and it all depends on where where location is. But by all means, please stop in. We'll get together for a coffee. Uh, you know, go for a walk, maybe take one of the trails in. Go up on top of it. I don't know if you you probably didn't have the time to go to Picnic Table Hill, which is now called Painters Point Hill. Uh, we had a contest to rename it. It's the most amazing site. It's probably about a an hour hike straight uphill, <laughs> mind you, but it's amazing. And you see the whole municipality, all Lake Superior, all the islands. Just an amazing, amazing location. And uh, the blueberries are amazing out there as well. So if you like blueberries, and it's usually typically in August, Amo. So. It'd be very in the blueberry season, so maybe put some time aside. We'll take a hike up there. It's it's a political day. Thank you for joining us today for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential. Now, as we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics from our guest today. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button today. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date on the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support either. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes or by visiting crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering you the kind of content you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of this community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues what truly matter to you and to our communities. Until next time, Stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.